Hi, my name is Gene Jordan. I'd like to give a brief video voiceover to how to compress module lessons. The objectives for today will be to explain the rationale for adapting the modules, um, look at some critical models and must-dos within a module, and identify flexible parts of a lesson that preserves rigor but increases accessibility of some of the lessons provided for us. Most of us have heard the idea that we can ignore, adapt, and adopt modules. There's so many people in the adapting stage right now, I thought it would be handy to hear um, one person's take on how to adapt these modules. If you're in the adopt and um, sort of in that school or the ignore, this might not be the most relevant thing to you. And my own take, which will influence how I present some of the material, follows very much the work of Bill McCallum and Dr. Andrew Chin. Um, as far as um, math thinking breaking down to application problems, fluency, and conceptual understanding. Um, you'll see that is a, um, a recurring theme in a lot of what I'm about to explain. Uh, the first problem I had is when I broke down the year's calendar into um, that they gave to us with the modules and compared it to our local Broom Tioga Bosis component schools, which schools locally are um, 15 or so schools um, changed to suit their own needs for half days but this is a core calendar many of our districts use so I used that when I planned out the lessons and I broke it down into 20 day segments and then put dates at the end of each of the modules. I was focused at the time mainly on 3 to 5 and 6 to 8 because they were the, um, the testing schedules and um, periodic assessment builds but looking at that there's a few things that will um, catch your eye. The first thing is for elementary schools, middle schools, any schools, you're looking at a start date that I assumed is the, um, what, the um, Monday after the first week of school. So that first full week of school. If you started module one, day one lesson then, your last lesson would be on June 26th. And I'm not saying June 26 isn't a rigorous math day for some of you, but many of our schools find that, that June is not the most um, everyday hardcore math um, month that we'd find on our calendar. So let's look back and look at what else we can find that might be an issue. Well, we also find that in uh, middle school and elementary school, there's no um, days provided for the state testing in April and early May this year and there's certainly no review for those assessments and there's no field trips or snow days considered so we have all these issues that sort of build up to be quite a problem and, and from the looks of it our calendars really do need to adjust to fit reality um, of our situation and I would argue that within each of these modules you might need to find three or four days maybe possibly five to start compressing to help you um, finish the topics because I think the idea of finishing modules late than the dates I have on here is really you're going to scavenge future dates, future lessons. So if you feel the lessons in module one are super important and deserve the two days, you have to be able to will or be willing to say they're so important I'm willing to take it from module four or three or another of your choice. But I think if you don't make those decisions, what you are is making a decision on truncating your lessons. So you could find yourself in the position of having the state test but not covering the material, which I think is um, unfair to our students. So consider the idea now early in the year of adapting our, our lessons to a calendar so that your students will have all the material presented and hopefully um, taught in a somewhat meaningful way and you are making those good decisions. Here's one way to do it. I bear, to me, I break it down to the most important things I need to know about, let's say, fourth grade, for example, module one. Uh, the first thing I look at is the date. October 15th. Let's uh, say that is a good day for you to finish the um, assessment and the entire instruction of that module one. The other important things I looked at are the actual models being taught within that module and I see place value models, vertical number lines, and tape diagrams. So if you're a fourth grade teacher, to me there's a very important reason to keep those models. As you're cutting things, I would think preserving these models are one of the most important things you can do, not only for your year in fourth grade as it progresses, 
but if you look at the fifth grade, I could replace the slide with a fifth grade pretty much. They talk, tackle fifth grade topics as worse with place value models, then they go on to vertical number lines, then they proceed to tape diagrams. So the um, absence of any of these models would hurt your um, cohesion within and across the school years. Take a look at module two. It's a little bit different. You're losing a lot of the measurement, but you have um, here finishing in 25, a short module. You have number bonds, metric charts, tons of those, a few tape diagrams and number lines as well. But again, you see the recurring theme. You see the model of tape diagrams being used again. Number bonds being pulled in from prior years. Again, in transition years, you won't have that um, background knowledge, but again, you should be introducing that if they haven't ever seen that before because they will have that again. Module three in the same grade level, you're gonna look at arrays. Again, though, the place value diagram, tape diagrams, and so they have a few new ones like the array and the partial product area for this year, but those arrays come from extensive array work in third grade. The partial product area is going to be seen um, pretty much all the way through algebra, so all good ideas to um, introduce and go deeply in, and this one, of course, has an end date of January 14th. Unlike those ELA modules, these are not all the same time periods. They um, very much are suited to the content. When you look at those main ideas, it's nice to dig down into the lessons next to see what exact lessons will you compress. And it's tricky business. But if you look at this one from grade seven, um, the first thing that I would argue that um, some teachers have used and I would say is a reasonable is to look is reasonable is to look at those lessons that go across two days. Perhaps they are, perhaps they are not good candidates for compression. Another thing to look at is the end of lesson and um, I should say end of topic lessons. Sometimes within these lessons at the end of topics you will find extensions or very rigorous interpretations of the standards which are good and sometimes great and completely I understand why you'd want to preserve them but sometimes they're a bridge too far for your students this year when they're lacking the background knowledge that they will have in future years so it might be somewhere there that you don't go to as deeply or as long because we need compression times those are the hard decisions I feel like we have to make something to consider. So my take on it is I have two answers, one for pre-K to five, the must-dos of the lessons. One of the things we can't escape is the idea that we teach them the concept that are laid out in the standards. So we must meet the standards. Um, there's no question to that. The debrief to me are unbelievably useful daily formative assessments help you know what the students know of what you taught. Without that, it's very, very difficult to focus your teaching on the most important things that will have the biggest impact for your students. So I'm a big believer in the debrief um, that can include the talking about the problem set, but especially the exit ticket to me are um, must-dos. The flexible components. I think you really have to take a hard look at the examples within the concept development. Sometimes the lessons themselves do a good job of bringing them from a lower grade level up. Sometimes I think you need a little help and you might need to choose more easily accessible numbers. The application problems, especially in the first module or two, I think you could consider having them learn the process of redraw, write, write by using below grade level questions and word problems. Not only for the accessibility of language, but for the math concepts so they learn the process. Eventually though, I think you need to give them at grade level difficult word problems that they have to interpret difficult text and provide the math structures and the reasoning behind those to answer questions. But for now, I think an inclined plane is called for. Fluencies. I think you need to choose the right fluency for those kids. And sometimes the fluency itself can be the most important component for success during concept development. Because during concept development, we don't want our kids to be slowed down because they're not clear on their fluencies. And that will be, at least to many teachers, I think, a pleasant surprise with how good kids can tackle a concept when they're comfortable with fact recall and procedural fluencies. If you look more closely at the pre-K to 5 breakdown, you'll see these four components. And within those, 
I feel like these are the things that you don't break. These are the chain that we keep and preserve. And the problem sets and the exit tickets, I think, are good measures for how they handle the rigor. At least modify, yes, but we need to preserve those. I think the application and the fluency, like I said before, can be modified to meet your kids. Sprint should always be, to me, culminating fluency activities. And if your kids struggle with a sprint, you might consider doing whiteboard activities or coral activities to build up their speed as well as their um, confidence and confidence. Within 6 through 12, my answer is a little different. Those lessons involve either problem set, Socratic, exploration, or modeling. With each one of them, you have an option to change. Sometimes the Socratic discussions are fantastic, five to ten minute good deep discussions and questioning. But if you're just reaching a few of the kids and you find it's not suiting your instructional practice, I would argue there's reason enough to modify that to fit your needs or your teaching style. I think all teachers are being stretched this year to try new things and that's great. And one of the things I think are fantastic are those exploration problems. Exploration problems are some of, in my opinion, those things that in mathematics they will remember for a lifetime. When they're doing work outside or doing work with um, hands-on materials, they will remember that. But that's not something we can do every day. But it is something that may be so powerful that the one or two days you invest in an exploration problem, you can hang your hat on all year long and go back to that problem, go back to that when you explore and deepen that concept. Um, modeling is the same way. The problem sets is the first one. I sort of skimmed over that because it's something I think that nearly every teacher um, is comfortable with, the presentation of a problem, the modeling of the solution. When I say that, I mean um, actual showing the work of how to solve it, uh, allowing the students some time to work together as a class on a couple problems, and then individually. So the sort of I do, we do, you do set, which I think we're all comfortable with as math teachers. I would throw this out there. It's, I'm sure, imperfect, but it's just my take on it because I haven't heard many answers. I've heard a lot more questions, so here's something to consider. That you always do the lesson concept, you preserve those models and the exit ticket. I would consider using just right numbers, but be careful when you're adapting those numbers because we can't reduce the rigor. One of the reasons that are exp that many people think that fractions are so tricky for kids is that we've taken fractions out not only out of our concept development time but out of many of our problem sets to reduce and make it more accessible so it's it's a definitely a balance you might want to adapt grade level sprints choose a few below grade level sprints there's nothing wrong with high school and algebra teachers doing third fourth and fifth grade multiplication sprints kids need that maintenance um, you might consider daily fluency changes to fit the lesson to help them speed up the process um, daily application problems, you might, we talked about that. Other things to consider, many teachers find it helpful if they did the homework the day before to focus their thinking and their teaching on the outcome. Take the assessment, make sure you understand the level with which you want their kids to perform. Create math journals are fantastic things. If you check my website, we have quite a few there. And create summative tests and quizzes. I think it's a great way to have um, grades for your grade book that are better aligned to the state test. If you have any questions, let me know. There's my email and a website. Um, hopefully, I helped you um, actually think through maybe um, even some good ideas on how to adapt a math module lesson. Thanks for listening. Have a good day, and goodbye.